I'm Mark. Uh, it's been a year since I came back to the meetup, I guess. Wow. Uh, Was it a year? I think more than that. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so, welcome back. <laughs> right, so, uh, so when Dan asked me to give a talk, I was thinking about talking about what we build for BT subscription engine. But after reviewing it, I think uh, we realized, I realized that um, it's not going to be very useful for people outside of BT. So um, I decided to drop it. But one topic that uh, keep coming back again and again when I prepare the talk is uh, how do we build a reliable system. And I think it's a more general thing that you guys will enjoy. Um, so I change it a little bit. Um, so there will be things about the subscription engine, but uh, it's going to be centralized around uh, robustness of the system in general. Right. Uh, so, um, right. Uh, so I'm not an expert on uh, a lot of this still. Um, so if you have any ideas, feel free to chime in uh, at the end. Right, so let's start. Um, so robust, uh, start the meaning of the word robust stems from a Latin word that means uh, hard, strong, and solid. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind when I read this is uh, Lego. Right? And the other thing is uh, a Nokia phone that I have been having for 10 years. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, right. So, but uh, it, those are examples of things that you would consider very robust. It lasts with time and it functions well. So, and uh, I think as engineer, when we try to build software, um, most of the time we idealistically aim for a robust system. So, because then less uh, drag for us, less support requests to handle and uh, we feel better within the system without bug. So, but it's not a, a very um, easy thing to build. Um, so even if you look at the open source, like well-known popular open source project nowadays, uh, there are times when things doesn't work right. Uh, so for example, um, in 2014, we have Heartlit. On, uh, recently, there's this thing called Dirty Cow on Linux. Um, then uh, just a few, uh, just a week ago, then there's the this DNS uh, the yeah. But uh, in in that case, the DNS system doesn't function as expect as well, and a lot of things still go down. And then uh, closer to home, when you look at a uh, system that you use daily, um, if you are aware of something called Jepson, it's a framework to test a uh, distributed system, and they run a lot of things like uh, MongoDB, React. Uh, console etcd through it and they discovered that um, on the system on uh, even they are well known and uh, there's a lot of good developers on it they don't function well on the time so it's very hard to build a uh, uh, robust software right uh, on the other hand um, what you consider robust might be very subjective as well um, so for example if you look at this function so how many of so let's just Look at it, a uh, very simple function. How many of you think this is an uh, example of simple and robust? I think so. Uh, no, so. All right, yes. Okay, that's, that's great. So on the, um, like everyone just immediately recognize that this function doesn't work when uh, you put an input that will over overflow the result. Ah, right. okay. So if you compare this with another version um, that I have below, then you would see that um, the second looks more reliable. <coughs> In this case, what happened is we define a very clear um, input and input boundary. Uh, we define a very clear output and what it should happen, and uh, the function works should work as expected. Right. Um, so um, this show that um, um, is um, you can you can build a robust function, but it's not as straightforward uh, as uh, you might think. And most of the time when you look at software, what uh, we, I, I would argue that what we tend to have in our mind is uh, closer to the second form. Uh, sorry, closer to the first form. And, um, um, and it's very close to a mathematical definition of function. Yeah. Actually, you can just get, it, uh, get the same effect by using in 64 or in 32. Yeah, yeah. As in, but I mean, when you look at the function conceptually, yeah. that's yeah. not what, like, if you work with a language for a while, then you learn this quirk and yeah. you learn to live with it. But um, conceptually, we don't yes. recognize it right away. Right? Uh, so the second function, the form is very close to a mathematical function where you have a defined set of input and a defined set of output and um, it works on the time. Right? 
Um, and then these are not anything new. If you have been programming with, say, Haskell or OCaml for a while, then this is what you tend to, to uh, write. Right. So um, still, most of us don't have the chance to work with functional language on the time, and there are practical reasons for that. Uh, one is bit, for example. Right. Um, so still, we can um, take advantage of this kind of uh, functional thinking in our design. Um, in uh, our design of system as a whole, so that we write better software. So, so that's uh, what I try to uh, will try to talk today through an example of uh, Viki, a piece of Viki subscription system that I worked on recently. Right. So the background story is this: um, so we have a subscription engine in Viki, and it allows for uh, people to buy a subscription in uh, on the web via in-app purchase on iOS and Android and enjoy it elsewhere in the system, right? Uh, and um, people just need to buy once and then it should uh, propagate everywhere else. Um, the previous system didn't do so well in the sense that sometimes you buy stuff, you get bills, you get charged, but it doesn't show up uh, reliably. Um, so uh, not a very good experience for the user. And um, since we are getting more people paying us recently, then it's become a urgent concern and then we started to rewrite. Uh, and uh, the, the stuff that we have is fairly simple, like depending on the bundle that you buy on the key. Um, your subscription end up in one of the four states. Right. At, the, um, at the first time you get, you get to a trial, uh, then you pay, you renew, and you get into a paying state. Uh, and then after that you keep renewing to be a subscriber. And uh, if any point, if at any point in time you fail to pay, you enter something we call a dunning state. So dunning is a kind of like industry word for all this thing, uh, where we try to charge you for X number of time. And if uh, if if we can't finish it, um, then we'll put you, we'll end your subscription. So this is very simple model, right? Um, and. Uh, uh, so this is general subscription in Viki. Uh, for Google, uh, it works more, so what I'm working on at that point was uh, the Google piece of the subscription system, like how people buy Android uh, subscription and then enjoy across Viki. Um, so Google subscription work more or less the same way uh, with just a few uh, constraints. So for Google, we are allowed to call this API which, allow, which return something uh, like what you see on the right side, there will be a start time and ex expiry time of the subscription. And uh, there is a flag called auto-renewing. That, um, But what we need to do is capture the state of the subscription on Google, which is not available here. And the reason for that is um, more or less business, because we need to treat uh, user in different state differently in Viki. So, um, so we have to take the expiry time here uh, and infer what state um, the user is in based on that and historical data. Okay, so th this is more or less uh, complex. And uh, the flow is something um, like, looks like something similar to this diagram. So people will buy Android subscription. Uh, the Google engine will give them an identifier called a purchase token. Um, then the Android client will send that with, together with the session token to our API, at which point we link that subscription to um, the user. And from then on, Viki is responsible to tracking and refreshing the subscription status of that user. Right? And then after that, any other client can just call the API, uh, Viki API, to get that information. So it's pretty standard, nothing really But the, the, the gist when we have to redesign the system is how do we make sure this flow works reliably in f the face of uh, network partition, in the face of uh, failure from our database, even sometimes from Google, uh, and so on. So, uh, and um, to do that, uh, we, we ran through a very long design verification phase and uh, get a list of, um, a big list of questions, a few of which I will list here. So for example, um, we divide it basically into groups. Um, and uh, so um, for example, one group would be um, 
how do we classify the raw input from Google API. Right. The second group is how do we how does our system run uh, in the face of network partition uh, or when its dependency doesn't uh, respond. Right. The next one um, is that we need to have like an historical audit trail so that we can trace back whatever happened in the system. And uh, so this is very important when you deal with money. Um, as you need to argue with people like why they get charged and so on. Um, and then uh, of course um, there's no perfect software so sometimes we make bugs and uh, we need a way to go back and fix the changes um, uh, not manually but uh, automatically and reliably. Right. Uh, and then the last step is um, when we have to scale thing and we have to deal with machine mechanical failure then what do we do? Right. So. Um, so I think it uh, depends on uh, how reliable your system is. Um, you will have to answer something akin to this at some point. Um, right, so our first, uh, so uh, let's take on the first question first. Uh, what are the possible inputs that we have from Google? So conceptually, it seems very simple. Google just return an expiry time. We just need to check that. Uh, and then we write a simple first cut code. Right, just checking the expiry time, take it minus from the last expiry time and compare. Yeah. What we found out is, um, so obviously we make some uh, um, design flaw there, but what we found more interestingly is that uh, the expiry time that Google provides is not very deterministic <coughs> in any fashion. Right. Okay, so that's interesting because I expected Google to be uh, <laughs> precise. Pretty precise. Uh, but we have data to show that and uh, we have to design around it. So for example, um, uh, here is uh, data from one guy that we have. So he started a subscription that lasts until 17th of October at uh, 1960, 1960 and 43. Right? Uh, the next day he went into what we call the Dunning State where he failed to pay. Google extend his uh, subscription by one day while it tried to do a retry, a retry on the charge. And then uh, as you can see, the time is not exact anymore, so it varies a little bit. The next day, that time increased again, increased again uh, for the third time. And then Google was finally able to charge the guy and uh, bring him to uh, the correct state. But then it deducts some time from his subscription period, right? So uh, not very... Um, what did Google say? Yeah. So we we, um, we contact them, but uh, it's taking a long time. So we just need to go ahead and work out the differences. Right. So, um, so this is more major problem because without understanding what can Google give us, we can write a very robust code. So, uh, so this happened, um, so while we was waiting for Google, we was, uh, I'm just doing trial and error and finally was able to uh, get a more or less working version of the code, but through trial and error and uh, put it on production because of time. Still, uh, when, uh, and a few days later, um, I was still worrying about the system when I was watching a talk called uh, uh, life beyond the illusion of the present. It's a very good distributed system talk uh, that you might be interested in watching. So in that talk, uh, the speaker argue about uh, when you build distributed system, um, you should consider time as uh, just another input to your system and not something that constantly is flowing. Um, so uh, somehow a few things clicked for me and uh, I flipped this thing around and say, what if what I have always been doing for trial and error is just uh, figure out the input space from Google. Right. So uh, I put out, because we have a system running for a while, I put out the uh, data from Google, run a few statistical stuff on it and try to plot a histogram My of uh, what Google uh, extend the subscription uh, expiry date uh, to. Right, so interesting result. Uh, we was able to group uh, 
Google data into uh, four distinct groups. One is a uh, thing that extends from zero to 80, which seems to represent um, dummy. Uh, then uh, we see it extends uh, people who are in monthly subscription by anywhere between 26 to 38 days. And if you're on a yearly subscription, uh, it extends you by uh, 307, 57 to uh, 365 days. So there's a few more down. Right. So, and then there's a bad case where Google give you an expiry date that is less than the one that you previously had. So not very good. But with this, uh, we was able to go back in the code and do very nice case analysis. And uh, I mean, because it is divided into nicely cases, uh, the code we wrote, wrote was much simpler. And then this is an example of uh, the bad case that I mentioned. So this guy um, has uh, increasing expiry time until he stopped reviewing. And then in, in that case, some, somehow the data on Google side become corrupted. And this happened for both uh, renewing and non-renewing subscription. Okay. So, so this exercise gave me a talk. Okay, so um, it seems that I was able to make a very, a much better design by treating um, my system as a function and uh, trying to map out the input space. Right, so what if um, not just input from Google, what if there is other things in our system that we can uh, think about as input and map out the complete space, then we can build a very rigorous system. So that's, that's the thinking that led me um, to this, some like uh, visualization of it. So I imagine the uh, tracking system I'm building as um, a function with one dimension of input is coming from Google API and then I was mapping out the space here. All right, so that works. Um, then we, I came back to the same design question we had <coughs> in the beginning and uh, tackled the second group. So what happened when uh, there are dependency that I use and uh, I was not able to contact them? So some variation of uh, that. So uh, obviously when we write the code, we already do a lot of error handling uh, for these things. And Go is a pretty good language because it forces you to consciously do this. Right, so I guess everyone is familiar with that. Uh, what, uh, what I realized is that um, this whole error handling exercise, ultimately what it does is again, um, help you map out an input space where um, input is health check of your dependency, right? Uh, and then uh, when you write code, then you would try to define the output, which either is a happy path where everything works or some failure path where something doesn't function well. And if you can clearly define uh, what your system behaves in all these cases, again, you get another level of robustness. Right. So and then come back to what else can we do with uh, the design question. So uh, we was looking at audit trail and uh, generating analytics in code. So this uh, we are locking stuff as we go already. And then um, for us that seems to be something like a side effect of running the function. And then if if you look at this, it's very. Uh, I think there's a semblance of state machine here. Uh, uh, I guess so you have input, you have output, you have side effect. Um, so which is, is what it actually is, right? Uh, but it's a very big and complicated state machine. So uh, basically, um, okay, so next. So we have uh, audit lock defined uh, as a side effect. The next, uh, how can we go back and fix historical error that we have? So this is an interesting one because um, it happens sometimes and uh, if you're not careful, you end up writing directly to DB to override your mistake, for example. It's not good. Um, what, luckily for me, uh, so I, I did have some bug with the analytics code, not the subscription status, but I still need to go and correct that. Luckily, um, when we write a system that we are already sampling uh, responses from Google, and put into our database. 
So, uh, so I, I primarily did this so that when uh, customer service people came and asked me why, I can just show them and say, this is Google problem and not my code. Uh, but it turns out that it helps. Um, so I started to design some uh, small tools that take uh, this sample, run it through my uh, system again, re you know, basically replaying it and uh, generate a different set of outcome data. And then here I realized that um, if I take the sample data together with when sample, the point in time where they are sampled, and think of that as input on the thing like audit log and analytics data and the output of my system, basically when you aggregate all of that, equal to a version of history. Um, so if uh, your code has a bug, it generates one kind of uh, history. Um, and then if you fix it and replay the historical event, it become another set of history. Yeah. And then sense. to correct uh, the result, all you need to do is merge the history. And it's visually, it's very similar to a way how we resolve conflict with a git merge. Right. So, uh, and, and then if you think a bit about it this way, what you can do is build automatic tools to um, resolve problem of your system um, without um, too much of human intervention. Like for us, what, because I'm just dumping analytics data, what I just did will be overwriting uh, what I have written earlier. But like imagine you are running a bank and uh, you have a bug, right? So now you end up with two versions of history, one in which you charge the user, another one in which you don't, and then you have to merge this together. So what would happen is that uh, when you merge the action, you need to take is refunding the, the charge event that you did wrongly. But um, because on this is deterministic, you can write a tool that uh, um, automatically do all these things. And um, you can mathematically be sure that it works. And then there's a the last part, um, which is very common in uh, this with the system, like what do you do when the machine goes down and uh, do you have redundancy to take over? Um, so it's a well-explored problem uh, with distributed system. And uh, the advice that they generally give out is that um, you design with network partition in mind, with machine failure in mind. And if you design your system for that, um, it works every, for every single other cases. Right. So with that, uh, I kind of, complete the model I have for the system where my input is uh, a few things like Google API, dependency, um, time when I do things in the system, and um, the network partition condition that can occur. And uh, I have a clear outcome that I want. Right? So, uh, so after this is done, um, we went back and we started rewriting and it become much clearer on what we need to write in code to achieve uh, the desired behavior. So it, it um, helps a lot, right? Um, right. Um, of course, in, in reality, achieve, this is a very theoretical model. In reality, um, it's not always clear how you can get a good uh, partitioning of the input space especially if you're building, um, building system for the first time, right? But uh, I, I think for certain things, um, for example, you know that network can either be up or down, so that's always there. You always design for both case. Yeah. Um, you know that. Um, yeah, from there. yeah, right, so, so on. And if you have any other type of input, you can try to do some data collection and do some statistical analysis on it so that yields you some insight. And uh, that will help you design a easier, it, it will help you to have an easier time designing a system. So right. Mark, interrupt me for a while. Yeah. Your entire analysis falls down to f of x comma t. Right. I mean, it's a function, basically. Yeah. f of x comma t, so right. if you, yeah. dependency matrix. Yeah. Okay. So if, if you can, so it leaves me with a question. So of course, in, in reality, you can do, you can get 100% on this analysis. So 
but still given a lot of this is common like network partition like um, so on is there a way for us to mechanically generate all this thing so as a programmer we look at um, the scenario beforehand and structure our program right especially this might be pretty important when you do design distributed system for me uh, my realization is that most of the time when we design thing uh, we take the problem we'll sit in some corner and then somehow magically came out with a model so and a lot of it depends on your own experience uh, the, the more experienced people will have more um, domain knowledge they would know the input space better um, but if there is a tool then you can be much more efficient at designing right and then uh, another thing is uh, when you look at this as a model function then uh, it deals with a lot of known knowns and known unknowns so how do you prepare the system for unknown unknowns <coughs> okay. that's another thing and then uh, the last thing um, so again this is a model you have to transform this into code. How do you know that your code uh, Im actually implement the model? So these are the three questions that still kind of like hanging. And um, maybe if you have built similar system, you have some experience, you can uh, tell everyone else. Right. So with that, um, I would like to conclude the talk. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Very, very innovative. Yeah. Um, how have you um, thought of the stock? And how many have you played the lock stick? Do you have some history or experience happened? How do you replay the, the scenario? Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, what I did, um, so basically, um, I was lucky because the initial design, um, we decided to capture the input, like all this, every single input and we leave our um, time. So some, in, in some system, right, you would use something like time, but now in your code to check what is the current time and your code behave uh, dependent on uh, some value compared to time, but now, right? So when I design, we also leave that out. We just take some time, which is external, um, and uh, use that as input. So we have a very complete uh, input in the system. So what we, I just did is basically spin up another instance, pipe all this uh, input into that guy. Um, again, it generates a different set of output, and then uh, I write a tune. So my output is basically entry in the database, and I write a tune to uh, replace the um, production data with the new stuff that I have. Yeah, so it's, it's an event-based. So I, what, what I did was basically transform it into an event-based system. And uh, because event is, um, can be stored and replaced, then you have all the benefits. Uh, I guess the model is, is that. They're talking about the, the Google subscription side. Yeah. 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 So, so um, in a way, yeah.